last session with verse 21. Um, but uh, we need to remember where this verse came from. He says, for to me to live is Christ. He didn't say for me to live is blessed by Christ. You know, prospered by Christ. He said, for me, to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. So, I'm going to write that right here. And let's just say to die Die is gain. I guess I'm going to make that in parentheses. To die is gain. And the dying we're talking about is a death in the Lord. Because why, why is to die gain when it's in the Lord? Shay? Because the economy of the Lord is increased through death. That's... Way more than I was expecting. I mean, no, no, it is. That's that's really, really a good answer. Okay, someone else? Because it's the only death that has a resurrection. It's the only death that has a resurrection. All right. However, if if you're a Christian, how many of you here are, are born again Christians? Raise your hand. Okay, good. There's several of you that aren't. And <laughs> meet me after class. Um, if you are born again, if you are truly born again, then to die is gain. We're not just talking about physical death. Now that's included, but that's not all there is in relationship to dying, and you know that. And the scriptures declare that in so many levels where death becomes, uh, uh, really that's what Shea was addressing, death becomes an avenue to increase Christ, to increase the kingdom of God, to increase, uh, um, um, trying to think of some of the, uh, uh, to increase our confidence to, and our boldness to speak the word without fear in the face of death, in the face of suffering, because we believe that those things actually, though meant for evil, are for good. I, wanted, I, I, I mentioned this last class, and I just said I, I cannot go without saying more about this reality because it is just so huge. Um, because um, to, to die is gain. is like a cornerstone of the kingdom of God. Um, let me just read some of my notes here. <clears throat> Here's, and I read some of this last week, but I want to read further now. Here is Paul's principle. For to me, to live is to live by Christ. Therefore, to die is gain. Why? Because you're living by Christ. And to die as one with Christ, as him as your life, God ain't going to leave him in the grave or isn't going to leave him in the grave, depending on what part of the country you're from. <laughs> God's not going to leave him in the grave. There's, there was an old song, ain't no grave going to hold my body down. Well, there ain't no grave going to hold my Jesus down. And I'm one with him and you're one with him. And that reality is great theology, but for those who really understand it and comprehend it and embrace it, it saves your life every day, maybe bunches of times a day. <clears throat> because, well, there is, because there is no fear in that. Because 
there can only be an increase because to die is gain. All right, so another way of saying it is to me, to live Christ is to live by his economy, which is that dying is not evil but gain. All right, I want you to think about this phrase on the board, to die is gain. And I want you to think about another phrase, to die is not evil, not in the Lord. Whether it be a sacrificial giving of yourself, what's called by uh, John in, the, in uh, his first epistle, his first letter, by this perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives. There's, there's the phrase. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Laying down of our lives. And really and truly, he's not in that case talking about actual death, though if it comes to physical death, fine. But he's talking about a sacrificial laying down of your life, your rights, your privileges. All right, um, his gospel and his methodology come down to this. To live is for it to be Christ's life in him. Okay, that's, that's a huge portion of it. To live is, is to allow it to be Christ's life, or he's not living unto God, he's just religiously setting about to please God through his own offerings, which are flesh, which are spotted, which are blemished, which are not the acceptable sacrifice. And every lamb had to be without spot and blemish, and thousands upon thousands, who knows, millions may have been offered over the course of Israel's history, each and every one of them representing not that person's selfless giving, with them giving a spotless lamb to God instead of themselves. Now they understood that. Christianity doesn't. They were a shadow. We're the real thing. <laughs> I mean, does that shock anybody? I mean, it's like they understood that. You know, you, you don't go behind the back and try to sneak in a spotted, you know, because whatever reason you're doing it for, if you're sincere in your reason for offering, then you will be sincere to not bring something God's going to reject. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And so, however, now, if, if you're just a reprobate, you, you'll try to sneak up on God with some, you know, half-hearted, you know, spotted, blemished, example of yourself I'm talking I'm still talking about the Old Testament in the New Testament you don't have to examine what's spotted and blemished and what's not Jesus is the only one who never sinned and we have sinned all have sinned and come short of the glory of God it's not you know that's that's not rocket science that's Romans 3 you know or you know all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, if they've all sinned, then they are all blemished, and we are all blemished. And if so, why in the world would we try to be sacrificial in and of ourselves? Does that make sense? Instead of, you know, instead of trying harder, try less. I mean, seek for it to be Christ, but quit trying to please God with blemished sacrifices. And you see, there is no way you're going to comprehend to die as gain until you've come to that. If you haven't come to that, then you, because again, there, you don't really believe that there's only one death that has a resurrection to it, and that's always related to Christ. Paul said, I bear about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. What's up with that? I thought Jesus was raised. He's victorious. Bless God. <laughs> you know, I mean, anybody heard that? You know, he's raised. He's victorious. He ain't dead anymore. I got news for you. We bear about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus. That's what it says. 
Well, but that was back then. That was the first century or, you know, whatever. No. That's, but it is only for a, a s small segment of Christianity, and that's those who walk as one with Christ. Because they know what is acceptable about themselves, and that is, first of all, being just as clear as I can be, what is acceptable about themselves is absolutely nothing. Say it again. <laughs> Nothing. Absolutely nothing. What is it about us that is acceptable? Christ. Jesus. Jesus is acceptable. And by the grace of God, we weren't accepted. By the grace of God, we were accepted in the one that's accepted. You know, we probably ought to start changing that just so we'll, we'll get it. Not to change the word of God, but because we don't get it. We are accepted in the accepted. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad somebody's getting excited about it because if I keep going here, I'm going to preach myself happy. I also may preach away this two-day headache, but we'll see. We'll see how that goes. All right, so um, his gospel and his methodology come down to this. To live is for it to be Christ's life in him and to die... Get ready, not just physical death, but to die is not ruin, loss, or failure. But it is the way to bring about gain according to God's economy. So, to bring about gain, you lose. To, to reign with Christ, you suffer. To be raised with him, you die with him. It's completely opposite of this world's way of thinking and approach. And it automatically, by virtue of being so exactly opposite, keeps all the riffraff out. <laughs> well, in reality, now there's a bunch you join and, you know, you know, you always have the mixed multitude that came out with Israel from Egypt. You remember that? There was a mixed multitude, you know. Anyway, and by the way, that mixed multitude were the whiners that were always whining all the time. They were, you know, they were the ones not in tune with God, so they, they had reason to whine. <clears throat> all right. Um, to embrace the mind of Christ, as will be described in the next chapter, will, will require incorporating the concept that to die is gain as a primary way of thinking and functioning. Now, you may not understand that statement, but I'm telling you, not that I know anything, not that me telling you anything makes any difference at all or is important at all, but from my experience with the Holy Spirit and from the things that he's shown me, not that that's greater than anybody else, To, to not comprehend to die is gain makes you function like a carnal Christian. I'm, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. It, it, because you are a carnal Christian because your mind has not been renewed to God's kingdom, his economy, his way of doing things, his way of being, ultimately. Um, and so, to embrace the mind of Christ, as will be described in the next chapter, will require incorporating the concept that to die is gain as a primary way of thinking and functioning. This is not easy because this way of thinking is completely contrary to the thought patterns held by the Adamic nature. Completely contrary. And nobody, listen to this, listen. Nobody can talk you into this. You know why? But you know why you can't? Because you're, you know, it's, it'd be like trying to talk the reason with the devil and talk the devil into not fighting against Jesus. It ain't going to happen. I've seen people try to reason with the enemy. Well, guess what? The old man ain't much difference. 
He's not going to, he, he is, he ate of the wrong tree and everybody out from him thinks in terms of good and evil. That's how they think. That is their mentality. And until that is broken by the revelation of Christ, of, of Christ and him crucified, that will remain regardless of his doctrinal pigeonhole theology, you know, of different thoughts and things that he thinks he holds and believes. It will make absolutely no difference in the crisis. He will, in fact, I probably got that written here, but he will self-protect. Um, well, here it is. While we may give credence to the theology of to die is gain, we will regularly go against this crucified way in our dealings with others because, in truth, we hold the premise of self-rights and self-preservation as higher than the cross and maintaining one with Je oneness with Jesus in this way. And, and by the way, we talk about oneness with Jesus a lot. This is a huge way of walking in oneness with Jesus. Now, I still don't think up to this point we have adequately explained what we're even talking about on this front. And we're going to expand pretty quick now in chapter 2. But, but this first chapter gives you lots of fodder for really grasping what's going on. Because he's only, he's only going to describe the pattern in chapter 2. He's lived this pattern already. And it's clear from verse 1 all the way to the end. All right. So uh, I'm going to read that again and then finish that. Oh, maybe not. While we may give credence to the theology of to die as gain, we will regularly go against this crucified way in our dealings with others because, in truth, we hold the premise of self-rights and self-preservation is higher than the cross and of maintaining oneness with Jesus in this way. Sadly, most of the time we will be completely ignorant of the times we do such a thing because the other way of proceeding is so natural to our self-life and because the crucified way um, has only been taught to us and has not been branded and emblazoned in our psyche by the Holy Spirit as the way of God and as the essence of the being of the living God. Until that happens, we will remain ungoverned in our soul and subject to the risings of a self-life that rejects the cross as a way of life but heads off in a direction to defend itself and to stand up for its own rights. And Come on, in this country, and I'm not finished with even with the paragraph, but in this country, we, we've been trained to stand up for your own rights. There are a lot of countries you, can't, you, you got no rights, you know. So we've been trained to stand up for Adam, you know. We've been trained, and, and Adam loves that, you know. Um, and, and when I say all this, I'm even saying it doesn't appear wrong to us. How can it appear wrong until you have seen Jesus by revelation face to face to the degree that you realize I am totally contrary to him. God, Father, allow the Holy Spirit to reveal his son in me. And that's what Paul called the gospel, Galatians chapter 1. When it pleased God, for the gospel which we preach is not after man, neither received I it of man, but by the revelation of Christ. And he says, for when it pleased God to separate me from my mother's womb, to reveal his son in me immediately. And, and so he, he's saying that's the gospel. The gospel which I preach, he says, is the revelation of Christ. Well, we say the gospel... We say the gospel is that Jesus saved the one that the, gospel, the true gospel came to put away. Anybody get that one? Yes. Anybody not get that? We, we're, what most of Christianity is saying is that the gospel is that Jesus came to save the one that Jesus died to put away. Because we don't, and again, you know, we can get all mixed up in this. And uh, I mean, it, it really is easy. And um, 
and, and I can't cover all the bases when I'm preaching. You, you do know that, right? I mean, there are gaps that I can't, you know, I'd have to preach everything that was ever true in God, every sermon, to cover all the bases. So I can't do that. And I say that for two reasons. One is because it's true, and two is that gives you an out. You know, instead of sitting there fidgeting and going, you know, you can go, yeah, yeah, he didn't cover my base. Of course, you'll still stand before God on your own merits and knowledge and everything. I won't be there. <laughs> but, you know, but that's fine. You can go your own way. <clears throat> anyway. But you know what? I mean, I'm just absolutely telling you the truth. I am not telling you to go my way. I am really seeing Jesus in the scriptures and want to have him revealed in me. And the Holy Spirit is just the most exciting best friend you could ever have because he gives you exactly what you want because the ones who, to whom he's really the best friend really only want Jesus. <laughs> And he is faithful to lift up Jesus and to teach us and to guide us and to, and to take that which is mine and show it unto you because of oneness now. Yes. I'm showing you this because you're one with this now. Yes. So, anyway. Um, um, the last phrase was, but heads off in a direction to defend itself and stand up for its own rights. For a person who is under the teachings of the Christ life, of the crucified life, in order to avoid living by it, he will have to devise his own understanding and doctrinal approach that can be effectively used to quell the voice of the mind of Christ and justify selfish action by calling it things such as righteous indignation, justice, and not giving in to the devil. Um, now, again, I can't cover all the bases. I know the devil is a sly old fox. Why, if I could catch him, I'd put him in a box. Anyway, and, and that he messes with you, uh, and that he, he, one of his favorite tricks is when God starts dealing with you about stuff, the enemy starts acting up. And so you don't even want to be dealt with of the Lord, not in, the, not in these deeper areas, because the devil's going to act up. And your higher goal is to calm the devil, not open the door to the Lord. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, the it's a truth. We're all that way. I mean, there are no, you know, there's no one you can look at in the room and go, I know they're that way. Well, I know you're that way. I know I'm that way this is us apart from Christ this is the way we are and and I, I believe there are times we you know and we do that every so often where we have some little deliverance services and stuff and I've had a couple of people say something to me and I think maybe it'd be good eventually uh, but I think right now we pursue the Lord and we keep our eyes on the Lord and and we realize that if we continue we shall know the truth and the truth will make us free and that's not saying that I don't think that, you know, we can pray for people. I'm saying, let's, let's, I'm with you. Let's, let's hear from the Lord in his timing. In the meantime, as much as you can, tell the Lord you're with him even though the enemy is messing with you. Does that make sense? I mean, you know, and say, no, the only way I can be with the Lord is when I'm completely free from him. That's not true. The devil cannot control your heart. He can mess with your emotions. He can mess with your mind. But he can't control your heart. You control your heart. <clears throat> Unless, of course, you're of your father, the devil. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. You would have come up with that on your own. You don't need me to tease you. <laughs> <laughs> like, like a tiger in a cage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I admit it. I'm terrible. <laughs> God, what's wrong with me? All right. <laughs> um, 
It is only by the grace of God that the next several verses give us a specific scenario in which we might rightfully justify ourselves by choosing a certain path, but are given a clear outline by Paul as to the proper direction to be taken. And okay, that last sentence, what I mean by that is, this is so wonderful, this, this way that this first chapter is written. I mean, this to die is game thing came totally out of the fact that he's in prison. And let me tell you, the next stuff that we're going to get into, he's talking about uh, to die is game. He may, you know, he knows he could actually physically die. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, that's, he's well aware of that. That's why he brings it up right after this. It's heavy on his mind. It is a real thing of contemplation. However, this is the same guy who, like in verse 12, he says, what has happened to me being in prison and suffering and going through this affliction has fallen out rather to the um, furtherance of the gospel because I'm going through a death so that life may come forth out of it. And already we see the results in that the, the believers, the, the brothers, have become more convinced and more bold in their declaring of Christ without fear. They may join me. They may get their heads cut off. But they know that that's going to turn to an increase, a, a setting forth of the spirit of Jesus Christ and turn to their salvation, meaning that's exactly what they wanted. That his life would come out of their death. And that's, that's what he wanted. And so, you know, he's, he's talking about that. And he says, and, there's, and I'm just sort of going down now from chapter 12 and just reminding you what happened. And he says, and there are those who are running around talking about Jesus and everything. And here's their purpose. Their intent is that they might add affliction to my already pitiful situation, but they suppose wrong because I, um, I what's this wording here? Because according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing, and then he says, whether by life or by death, nothing I'll be ashamed, but that Christ will be magnified either by me dying or by Christ living. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Isn't this a wonderful book? I mean, isn't it? I saw the devil in a couple of you and you went. I hate this book. I hate you for talking about it. <laughs> All right, so um, so Paul is on the verge here of giving his most blatant uh, example of what he's trying to communicate and what he will totally spell out in chapter 2. He's going to blatantly lay it out. So that we can, from his experience, find, begin to sort of see a pattern, find elements to the pattern, and find the true actions of Paul that motivated his words based on a certain realities that he has pertaining to Christ crucified. And it's really, really glorious because we see in his example that he's about to give us, we see the living Christ in someone. We see the true definition of Christ crucified as pertaining to how we live. Yeah. As pertaining to how we live. We see it. We see it in a man. We see it in a person. And I believe this is this old, this old brother Paul, when he was brother Saul, he saw it in a guy named Stephen who gladly laid down his life, who did so and the gospel sprang forth even stronger than it was in Stephen. It was strong in Stephen, wasn't it? 
but nothing compared to Paul, the guy standing there that's watching this whole scenario of selfless giving. And he's wondering about this guy because the whole time he's not looking at the earth, he's looking above, he's looking at Jesus. Remember? Okay. So there is this, <laughs> I know where she's heading. Speaking of, I know that uh, Kim is gone. Can anybody break into the uh, snack bar and get me something to drink? I'm just parched, parched. I think it's parched in the King James. All right. Um, so we want to look at, uh, ver we want to begin now in verse 22. So we're actually, I don't know how long into our class, but we're just now beginning the next verse that we wanted to. But um, We're going to start at 22, and I want to sort of uh, group 22 all the way down to 26 together. Uh, if we may, if we may do that. Here, you didn't have to open it. You could have just hit me long. Oh, whoa. I'm not used to him spinning it. Just, give me a spiral for God's sake. Yeah. It's like their re your reactions here. You're like James Bond. You're shaken but not stirred. <clears throat> oh. All right, verse, uh, tw starting with verse 22 through 26. By the way, thank you, Shay. Um, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what shall I choose I know not? For I am in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. <clears throat> oh, my Lord, my Lord, the things that are, that are here. Um, we, we see Paul uh, is in a struggle. We see that there is um, two options. Don't you hate it when there's options? And in that, uh, his, his wording here is sometimes remarkable um, because it is, it's so unassuming in its nature. And yet, when you comprehend what it is that he's saying, it's like an atom bomb. I mean, it's just powerful. It is full of power. Let me just read some notes because it'd be good to get down the road with some of this. Here in the first chapter, Paul sets forth the principle that is so prominent in chapter 2 and chapter 3. My desire is to depart, he says. Now, that's not the principle, but that's the, this is setting it forth. My desire basically is to depart. And he says these words, which is far better. Right? I mean, I, I, if I depart, I go be with the Lord. If I stay here, it's good for you, but... All right? The specific desire mentioned here is the desire to die, that he may be eternally with the Lord in spirit, soul, and in body. He does not mince words here, for clearly he possesses a desire to be free from this world completely that he might be with the Lord. The fulfillment of that desire would also stop the entire added affliction that was being heaped upon him by others. This was no small desire that worked within Paul for his wish 
for it had set up a wrestling match in opposition with a desire to remain for the good of others. Meaning, this is to, to depart and be with the Lord was a huge thing because it was, it's just this huge wrestling match going on. Okay? And from that, what we should see is that, you know, well, I'm, I haven't really got into the, the meaning of all of it yet, but we should see that Paul also is pulled, not by the devil or the world, but pulled by godly things that are not what God wants. I mean, we're all fighting the devil and trying to keep the devil or the, you know, the world or the, you know. <laughs> but um, I, I shared on Sunday uh, in the scriptures in Matthew 23 that Jesus kept pointing out that there was greater things. He wasn't saying anything was bad. He was saying, you're not honoring what's greater. In fact, you're honoring lesser things as if they were greater. And he said, these things you should have done, but this is, this is the deal. Okay? Well, we've got a similar situation here. And, uh, you know, just a reminder, the cross isn't always about the old man. The cross isn't always about sin. And, and the, the, the Old Testament example of that is... Uh, Abraham offering up Isaac. Isaac was given of God. Isaac was the promised seed. Right? And here's an altar. And he's having to take Isaac to that altar. And it's like, well, he's not Adam. I mean, you know, Abraham wouldn't say that because he knows better. But you and me. Well, Isaac ain't Adam. He's of you. He's given of you. He's the promise that everything's going to come out of him. I can't kill him. This ain't right. That's some wrong teaching you're laying on me there. I mean, put yourself in that situation. Yes. Didn't it say somewhere in the Bible, I'm not sure quite where, that, Ad, that um, Abraham believed that God could raise his son even, you know, because he believed God about Isaac being the promised seed, so if he was willing to sacrifice his son, it, it does say that he, you know, believed that God could even raise his son from the dead. That's it. And that's, <clears throat> that's the key. That is a, that is a true uh, explanation of to die as gain, because, well, why add death to it? He's the promised seed. Just let him go be the promised seed. Just like why add death to Jesus? Just let him go around and evangelize for God's sake. That's the great commission. Pardon? And, and yeah, and if it dies. And another way of saying that is to die is gain. To die is gain. And, and if we don't comprehend that, again, we're going to self-protect. We're going to say no. We're going to, do you, anybody ever heard the term backslider? Raise your hand if you've ever heard the term backslider. You know where that comes from? Comes from, well, where does it come from? Yeah, there was, a, uh, he calls him a back, calls Israel a backsliding heifer. Well, you know, some women would take issue with that. <laughs> Backsliding heifer, you? Particularly if you're from Texas, that you might hear that. Um, of course, I never called my wife a heifer. I called her a little filly. <clears throat> but it was trying to get that heifer to the altar, and he's backsliding, going, no, and he's trying to get away from going. Yes, Greg. I think what bothers people about the whole uh, thing about uh, Isaac is that it really comes down to that we want we want Jesus to be crucified but only so much. Yeah. Because if we want him to be crucified in the sense that he can bring us salvation, 
but not in the sense that if he changes completely, then we change completely. Yes. We wanted Jesus that can die and then bring us to prices. Yeah. We want him to die and bring us up yeah. and not have to go through anything. You know. And that's what I've heard people say that. They've said it to me over and over. You know, well, Jesus died. We don't have to die. I said, well, how about if I show you 15 scriptures in the New Testament that says you do? Well, they're not in there, or they're, you're twisting them. Okay, let's start with Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Now, in what manner am I twisting that? Never mind, I'm sorry. But it's, it's just, you know, I mean, it's just to me, you know, before I saw this, I would read my Bible and had no clue of this kind of stuff. And I was happy to follow Jesus because he was going to give me everything I ever wanted. You know, I mean, golly, what a deal. You die, I get everything. And you're going to love it when we get to chapter 2 and hear Paul's <laughs> talking about that. Because he really says, he says it's sweet, baby. He says it's sweet. Okay. Um, so, the specific desire, okay, he, he does not mince words here, for clearly he possesses a, des a desire to be free from this world completely that he might be with the Lord. The fulfillment of that desire would also stop the entire added affliction that was being heaped upon him by others. This was no small desire that worked within Paul, for his wish for it had set up a wrestling match in opposition with the desire to remain for the good of others. Which direction would he choose and why? What is the inner economy and government that would win out in this struggle? <clears throat> and, you know, I mean, if I could draw up this, if I could draw it up either on the board or, draw, or have people come up here, and I could put it into a real world context, you, you know what I'm saying? Instead of just outside of some little story here, make it an actual type situation that you might find yourself in. And then me point to you, and because and, I know what you would pick, you'd pick the right way when you're up here. Right. I mean, I know that. But what I would like doing is to point at you and ask you why you would make that choice. Oh, I know. I know I would hear, well, for God or another. Um, because the lamb in me just does that but Paul really has this thing figured out he really does and he's gonna he's going to release some of it now before we get to chapter two <laughs> you like that <clears throat> all right so my last two questions were which direction would he choose and why what is the inner economy and government that would win out in this struggle in the rest of these verses, the apostle relates to, to us his choice. He will remain. He, will rem he won't die and go be with the Lord, which he said is far better. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't jump to a conclusion too quick. Far better for who? For Paul. It's not far better in general. If it was far better, why doesn't Paul, what's wrong with you? Why don't you go with what's better? You, you follow me here? Why don't you go with the thing that's more right with God, for God's sake? You, you getting that? No. It, he, stri he simply means it's far better concerning himself. But to remain is more needful for you, all right? Um, all right, so in the rest of these verses, the apostle relates to us his choice. He will remain, but strictly on the basis of how it benefits others. In other words, out, even though it's not the exact same words, it is the exact same Jesus coming out that is saying, but not my will, but thine be done. Do you hear it? 
Do you hear it? It is that rising of that sweet incense to the Father that is saying, nevertheless, nevertheless, though that would be far better for me, not my will but thine be done, because going to this cross is for others, not me. It wasn't for Jesus. Jesus didn't need to go to the cross. I mean, for himself. Do you understand that? Jesus didn't, you know, there was no personal reason for Jesus to go to the cross. And there certainly wasn't any personal benefits, ultimately. And, and I know you're, what you're thinking, and probably something over in chapter 2, but we'll have to wait to explain that, that that is not the right view of this. But anyway. Uh, Is that a Bible or a color? Yeah, it's a color book. <laughs> um, probably everybody's seen it, but it just hit me that actually in both circumstances he chooses death. Yes. Death. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to get into that here pretty quick. Um, all right, so he goes against his own desire because, folks, what, were the, what was the wrestling match over? It was over his desire to depart and be with the Lord and his and God's desire to remain for others and probably others' desire to remain. Okay? So that means that he goes against his own desire, his own best desire. Is that true or not? Now, this is very important because while it's still in a glass darkly, this is very important. He goes against his own desires, accepts suffering, hardship, and loss, so that the lives of others may be yet be enhanced in the Lord. He embraces the faith, the economy of God, the premise that dying is gain and not evil, but chooses the dying that is most like Jesus' death, a death for others instead of a death for his own benefit. He chooses the cross, not just a death. Remember, there's only life out of one death. That's Christ, if you understand what we're saying here. All right, so let's, let's, let's deal with what Carolyn was addressing. In these verses, we are presented with two kinds of death, and that's, that was what she said. One is obvious and one is not. Both forms of death end with gain, because he said to die is gain, so if he died, it was gain. Both of them end with gain, don't they? Okay. Um, okay, both forms of death end with gain, but the question is, who will benefit most from the death that we choose. Who will benefit most from the death that we choose? For example, physical death, which Paul is talking about, to die in, in that sense. For example, physical death is seen by Paul as personal gain. Is that correct? Personal gain. But to die is gain in this case, is it not? To die is gain in this case. But he's, he's seeing beyond certain things that we don't see and we don't make decisions on. He's seeing that it is personal gain and strictly personal gain. We just kind of... We choose something, and we don't even know why. Usually it's for self. I mean, not, you know, we can take that in a bad context, but, you know, we pretty much the way most Christians live is just like the world. Everything that comes your way is evaluated as to how it can help you, bless you, uh, network with you, you know, do, you know, 
benefit you in some way. And nine times out of ten, if there's a relationship that you can't see any gain in it for you, you'll stop it. <laughs> it's true, and we all do it. I mean, again, we all do it. That's not a point of condemnation. But you know, how are we ever going to be real if we can't lay stuff on the table? You know what I'm saying. I mean, you just, you just got to lay it on the table and go, I don't like the way that looks, but doggone it, that's a fact. You know, it'll save you from stoning somebody that may be of God later on. I said that for personal gain. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so let me read that again and then the next one. For example, physical death is seen by Paul as, as gain, but it's personal gain. However, to remain, to remain, and not go on and be with the Lord is also a form of death to self. Both forms of death embrace the concept that to die is gain. So what we conclude from this with this statement on the board is that's a great statement, but it must yet be qualified. According to what we've just discussed, this is not just a standalone statement because you will be confronted with several options, even in death. And will you know what direction to go? You see what I'm saying? Will you, will you make the right decision? Will you even know that the decision Paul made is right and why it is so right? That's the, that's the killer right there. All right, let me make sure I can finish this up here. Um, both forms of death, death embrace the concept that to die is gain, but one form is more easily received because it personally benefits self. One form of this death, and that's the one we usually choose because we see how that's best for me. I mean, many times when people come to me and they want counseling, they, they say, okay, well, I've got this decision and that one. What do you think is the best one for me? Yeah. Well, neither one of those. It's this cross thing over here. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> even the vilest and most loathing human creature on the planet can be found choosing a death that brings an end to all misery, mistreatment by others, and results in eternal bliss. Hallelujah. Are you that vilest, loathing person? <laughs> in other words, anybody can pick the end of all mistreatment and affliction and go into eternal bliss. Well, yeah, I choose that. That's usually the basis most people accept Jesus on. Come on. I mean, that's why we need to grow up in him in all things. Not just with him or by him. In him. In union with him. And allow that oneness of the juices that are the life, the selfless life of Christ to fill these, these just dirt bags. <laughs> Earthen vessels, sorry. All right, so uh, that death is instantaneous, being gratified with an immediate positive outcome, being with the Lord. Don't you love, like those instant gratification ones with immediate positive reinforcement? Yes, you do, Adam, don't you? <laughs> The other form of death has no personal re reward built into the immediate outcome. It is a long, drawn-out death. Your primary re reward is that others will reap the benefit of such a choice. They become your joy 
and crown instead of being crowned with gold and seated in a place of honor. Because he said, you are my joy and my crown. You see the, the significance of that statement now compared to, you know, well, I just like you people, or y'all make me happy, you know, or whatever. He's not saying any of that. He's got none of that. He's saying that th you're my resurrection. You're the fulfillment of this death. You're my joy and my crown. And instead of taking a crown, well, I'm the Apostle Paul. I'll be one of the 12 elders maybe. And I'll get a crown, you know? And seated in a place of honor. Well, come on, man. That's, that's, the, that's the deal. That's what most people want. That's what they're after with the Lord. And Paul traded in that gold crown for them being his crown, them being his joy, and them being his resurrection. Um, and then I made the, this is my last statement, but I, it was a question, so we'll come back to it when we come back. Why would Paul make such a choice? Because there's still more to this statement for, or to die is gain. Again, it goes deeper. It must be dissected further, and it must be comprehended in light of, and I'm going to use a phrase that I'll use a lot, but you hear it all the time, and I mean something completely different, in light of Christ crucified. We'll explain it eventually, but, you know, and we're getting closer. All right, let's take a break.